If you had told me that one day we would be doing 3D work in a browser, I would not have believed you. And yet, here we are. This is Spline, a 3D application that runs in a browser, and I must say it's quite a capable app. We can model, sculpt, texture, and light a scene right within our browser window without having to open a dedicated 3D application. Let's see things in more detail. When I first tested out Spline, it was still in a pre-beta form. It definitely showed potential, but there were quite a few rough edges. Fast forward a couple of months and Spline is now in beta. There's a ton of new features, and even though there are still bugs and some uh, weird quirks, the app feels quite solid. If you're not a 3D user and you're mainly doing graphic design work, Spline is probably one of the best ways to get started. It's really easy to pick up, it has a very friendly UI, and you won't feel overwhelmed like you would with uh, Blender, Cinema, or Maya. One of Spline's killer features that's going to appeal to everyone, 3D professionals included, is its ability to display 3D content on any web page. So we no longer need Sketchfab's player to display a 3D object on a website. We can embed our object without any annoying interface elements around it. This feature alone will make any 3D user want to work with Spline. It just unlocks a whole new way of displaying your 3D work. This text element is a 3D object I created in Cinema and then imported as an OBJ and Spline. There wasn't a lot of work needed to prepare it for the web page. I just created a simple material, defined the movement, added a light, and that was basically it. The exporting process is a one-click solution and it doesn't involve movie files or GIFs. It's an actual 3D object we can interact with. Or let's take this 3D scanned object. With Spline, we now have the perfect way to showcase all the details. This, by the way, is from a collection of 3D scans I worked on the past few months, so if you're interested, you can find more details on my website. The actual scan of the croissant has quite a dense mesh, so putting that in Spline would be quite resource heavy. But with ZBrush, I could quickly decimate the mesh and import a lighter version of the object in Spline, but with enough detail for people to appreciate the capture. Before I show you how we can display a 3D object on a page, let's first go through the basics of Spline, just so you have an idea of what's possible. I'm going to use the application instead of the browser because of some glitches I had with the interface, but the desktop application is no different than the web app. As a matter of fact, the desktop app is just a wrapper for the web application. So let's see what we have. The left side is like the object manager in Cinema, and the right side is like the attribute manager. So on the left, we're going to see all of our objects, lights, and cameras, and on the right side is where we'll adjust the settings of all these objects. At the top, we have all of the preset objects and modeling tools. Some of them are exposed already, but if we click on the plus icon, we can see the complete list. So let's build a very simple object. Let's start with a cone. I want to bevel out the top and bottom, so we'll go to the right side here and adjust the corner radius. The typical commands like copy and paste work as expected, so let's duplicate the cone by copying with command and C and pasting with command V. Now I'm going to squish the top a little bit and then resize the whole thing. Let's move it to the top and let's copy and paste again and move this piece to the bottom. Scale it up a little bit. And just like that, we have a stylized tree. Now we can group everything together by hitting Command and G, and let's put our object to the center of the world. Snapping works by default, so centering the object is going to be super easy. And to do that, we're going to use our different views. We can switch between them with this handy little widget. So we can go to the top view by clicking the green ball, and now we can move the object around until it snaps to the center. Now let's go to the side view by clicking the red ball and let's move the object again until it snaps to zero. This whole process is actually much easier and faster to do here than in cinema. We're not restricted to preset objects or primitives. We're free to build our own objects. There will be some limitations, but there's quite a lot we can do with the tools available. So we have the ability to use laving operations or if I bring up a cube, we can use the knife tool to create some extra loops and then we can use extrusions to get the extra shapes we want. 
We can also use sculpting brushes to further modify the shape of our object. I don't know what this monstrosity is, but what you can get out of all this is that we have multiple tools to help us build our objects. Let's delete this and let me show you one of my favorite things in Spline, the material system. There's a lot of flexibility there and we can easily get really good looking results. So let's style our little tree here. To give a material to our object, we can either click on one of the elements and start adjusting its material or we can create a new material and apply that to all of the objects. Let's do that. By clicking on the surrounding area, we can access the settings of our scene. So here we can create document wide materials. Let's call this tree. And now we can apply that material by selecting all objects and clicking on the newly created material. Nothing really changed because we haven't really done anything to the default material. So let's start editing. As you can see, we have the ability to stack different layers, which is what gives Spline such flexibility. So the base is the color of the object. Let's change that to something green. And on top of that, we have the shading model. Fong, physical, Lambert, etc. Let's stick to Lambert, and now let's add some extra elements on top. The shading is a little bit too contrasty, so let's add a Fresnel to brighten things up. To add a little bit of detail, we're going to add a noise layer. We have several options to choose from, but let's stick to the basic one and adjust the scale of it to something that fits the object. We can also adjust the blending mode, so let's pick overlay and adjust the opacity a tiny bit. Perfect! Now things blend a little bit better. Here's another cool part. Let's say that we want to shade this area a little bit more because it's a tiny bit too bright and it should be darker because it's hiding underneath this object. We could use a depth mask for that. The whole process is very interactive and really easy to figure out because we can preview every single step in real time in the viewport. So let's build our depth mask. I'm going to unlink the material so we can adjust things per object and let's add the depth mask layer. The moment we click on the mask, we get some helpful widgets in the viewport that will help us set the gradation the way we want. We can move the gradient around, shorten or increase the distance, and so on and so forth. We can switch between local or world, whatever we do, things update accordingly in the viewport. Now that we have the gradient the way we want to, we can change the blending mode to multiply. And let's reduce the opacity of the effect a little bit so things blend nicer. We would have to repeat this process for all other elements of the object, but you get the point. With just a couple of adjustments, we can get the look we want, and without having to spend a ton of time. Now that we have the basics down, let's see how we can do all this cool interaction stuff with our objects, and also how to embed our objects into a web page. I created this uh, simple scene here, and I have a really simple interaction in mind. Every time we hover over one of the objects, they're gonna bounce and float in midair, and then, when we move away, they're gonna go back to their original position. Perfect. Let's start with the not object. We need two states. The first one is gonna be the one we already have, and the second one is gonna be the floating one. So in the state section, we just need to add one more. Let's move the object around, rotate it a little bit, and I think we're all good. Here's the default state, and here's the floaty one. Now, let's set up the action. Let's make sure that the base state is selected, and let's go to the events section and create a new one. And we're introduced with a couple more options. The start type means it will start immediately when the scene loads. So, let's see how that looks. Not bad, but since we want our mouse to trigger the action, we need the mouse hover option. Now, let's give it another try. And it's exactly what I had in mind. Since we want a more bouncy animation, we should choose the spring option. Yep, that looks much nicer. Increasing the stiffness will enhance the springiness, so basically we can just play around with all these values until we're satisfied. Now all we need to do is repeat the same process for all other objects. 
This is quite uh, straightforward to do, so let's try something else. Let's say that when we hover over the not object, all other objects will start floating as well. To achieve that, we're gonna take advantage of this option here, add new object to event. But before we do that, let's set up the different states for all other objects. For the sake of time, let's just do two. Now let's add the two objects in the event and use the spring transition for both. If we preview things, nothing will happen. And the reason for that is because we need to change the state for both objects. Currently, we're using the base state, which is the default one, so we need to pick the second state. Let's preview things once more. And now our setup works as expected. As you can see, we can create a lot of cool little interactions. Another really nice one is the look at event. Let me show you with a simple cube. We need to adjust the distance to a lower value. And now if we preview the interaction, you can see that the cube follows the mouse pointer. <laughs> really cool. You can use that command for eyes or for arrows, stuff like that. Now let's go back to our previous scene and let's make it a little bit more lively. Let's add a tiny bit of movement so it's not just sitting there. So let's group everything together and let's create two states for this group. The default state is the one we already have, and the second one will have everything rotated a little bit. Awesome. Now on our event, we will use the default start type, and since we want the movement to repeat, we need to click yes on both cycle and repeat options. Now let's hit preview. I don't really like how fast it goes, so let's reduce the speed. Let's do three seconds. Yep, that feels much nicer. And now if we hover over the object, our objects start floating. <laughs> Excellent. All that's left is to embed the scene to our web page. If we want to, we can use different frame sizes, but I think this feature is still a bit buggy, so the results won't be that predictable. For now, let's pick full screen and let's hit export. As you can see, we don't really need to do much. Everything is handled by Spline. Once the links are prepared, we just have to copy the iframe link and paste it to our page. It's really simple. I'm using Squarespace, but the process is gonna be the same on all other hosting providers. For Squarespace, we need to use the embed option and then paste the link into the field. Depending on the format, we might have to adjust things. So instead of using a percentage, we could use a pixel value. That's up to you and how you want to format things. And now our 3D content lives on the internet. <laughs> that is really cool. I think this feature alone is worth using Spline. It unlocks so many possibilities, but we need to be a little bit careful. For example, if we use several heavy scenes in one page, things will slow down. But that also depends on the browser. Safari seems to perform the best with no dropped frames, and Chrome the worst. In Chrome, the fans of my computer spun up as if I was playing a demanding game. The fans do spin up with Brave as well, but the performance is much better. So my guess is that some things on the 3D side are not that optimized in Chrome and Brave. And speaking of Chrome, I also had some issues with the design graphic. In all other browsers, the object displayed correctly, but in Chrome, the object was kinda corrupted. I only saw this issue with this specific object, so you probably won't stumble on this type of thing at all. Spline is still in beta, so expect to hit some bugs. I had several instances where things stopped working, icons and previews stopped displaying, or interactions just refused to work as expected. But I'm sure these things will be ironed out the more the app is in development. Despite all these issues, it's a really impressive app, and it's amazing to see how well the program works even in this beta state. I would highly encourage you to try out the app, it's a game changer as far as 3D previewing on the web goes, and it's also a lot of fun to see how things are progressing in the world of 3D. I'll have the link for Spline in the description below, so make sure to check it out. And I think that's about it for this video. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.